here out in the middle of LA County, we are able to take what we have, the rice, what we have, the water we have, and we try to create the best sake possible. We measure exactly how much rice we're gonna use so that we can calculate at every step how much moisture the rice is gonna gain. Cow Rose is a founding variety found in California. This particular rice is a 50% polished down. Sake rice is polished usually between 50 to 70%. Outer layer is where all that protein, fatty acid, bran is at. You want to get, get rid of all those materials that you don't need, and you want to get to that center starch of the rice. Japanese sake brewing is the only um, industry that uses um, the method to polish down the rice. Depending on how many percent it is polished, it'll create different flavor profile. In this piece of rice, you see a white core. That's just starch. And in Japanese, we call that shimpaku, which is the heart of the rice. And that pure starch is what brings out fruitiness in sake. At this moment, we only focus on using one rice strain. And that's because we want to create this relationship with cow roast rice. So this is our tank full of filtered water. We go through two filtrations to get all that unwanted minerals out of there. The water is very important in anything really, beer, sake, wine. More than 80% of what you drink is water. Californian rice grew in Californian water. So I believe that making sake in Californian water with Californian rice is the best combination. I learned this technique from a very small award-winning brewery called Inaba Brewery in Japan. They still use hand-making techniques and I was really intrigued by old way of making sake without too many machinery. All that white stuff is bran and rice powder that we don't want. We don't want to wash too much or you will lose nutrients that we actually need to make healthy koji and for healthy yeast fermentation. When you're hands-on with your raw ingredient, you get to feel it, you get to have an intimate relationship with it. If you rely too much on machines, you stop learning about the rice. What's important about being a sake brewer is understanding your rice and how it reacts with the water. Depending on the temperature of the water, the rice will absorb the water at a different speed. I believe that as a sake brewer, I, I have to learn the raw method first before I start to rely on machine. And that's how I grow as a brewer. And once it's 15 minutes in the water, I'll take it out and start draining. So this rice, we're making it for koji. We're measuring the weight to make sure that the moisture level is right where I want it. And I'm spreading the rice evenly in the steamer. Koji needs moisture to grow. Perfect amount of moisture in the rice is very important to make a good quality koji. I'm looking at how shiny the rice looks. If it's not shiny enough, that means it's not enough moisture. I'm gonna put this cover over it. If the steam rises, it's catching all that water. One hour each layer. Rice has been steaming for one hour. After steaming, I'm looking for around 15% increase in weight. So I do like to use all my senses while I'm making sake. I try to taste the rice at each stage. As I'm chewing, it's holding its shape, so I know that the doneness is right. Mm -hmm. 
I give it a mix to help cool down. I'm also trying to separate each piece of rice. So making sake is something you have to be present for in every stage. You have to know the status of your rice at every stage. Is it moist? Is it too hot? Is it too cool? So now we got all 50 pounds of rice onto the cooling table. I try to reach 33 degrees Celsius when I'm inoculating with the spores. It looks good. Moisture level is just where I want it. It's not too sticky. I'm gonna measure a precise amount of koji four that I'm gonna use to sprinkle on, onto the steamed rice. So the rice has been cooled to the temperature that I wanted. Now we're gonna inoculate with koji spores. These are very sensitive microorganisms. You wanna be very careful exactly how much is sprinkled onto the rice. Those tiny powdery looking seeds, they are landing on each of the rice grain right now. They're gonna start looking for moisture, start to look for starch to feed on, and then eventually turn that starch into sugar. All alcohol needs sugar to produce alcohol. In wine, that sugar comes from grapes. In beer, it comes from germinated grains such as barley. Sake rice is all starch, just like barley. But instead of germinating rice, we grow koji on the rice. Koji is what adds the most flavor in sake. Koji likes to be at a certain temperature level. This is so that the warmth is maintained inside and also keeping any bacteria out of the way. At this point, it's gonna be moved into the koji room. This is my koji room. I'm gonna stick a temperature probe in. And we're locking in all that moisture. Koji is the most sensitive and important process of making sake. It's kind of like um, putting a baby to sleep. After 22 hours, we start transferring the koji into separate boxes. If you just let it sit in this big mold, it's just gonna overheat. I will leave it in here like this for another six to eight hours. So this is koji at 45 hours from when we inoculated this. How long we keep it in this room is very crucial to the flavor profile that you're looking for. You want that koji to penetrate inside the rice. It will depend on the sake brewer, but for me, making koji is the most important process as a sake brewer. This will decide how your end product will taste. After 45 to 48 hours, I will take it out of this room and cool it so that it stops propagating. If we keep, continue to let it grow, it will spore, turn green and yellow, and you don't want that in sake. You see all these white things on the right? That's koji. This koji was in production for 48 hours. Now it's complete. One of the most unique process in sake production is what's called multiple parallel fermentation. Multiple parallel fermentation means starch turning into sugar, sugar being turned into alcohol. This is all happening at the same time in the same tank. Hatsuzoe is when the least amount of rice, water, and koji goes in. We start with the water. We put in the necessary minerals, and this will create an environment that is clean and safe for the yeast to properly grow in. And then the koji goes in. So we're making a water full of sugar and enzymes. After 30 minutes, steamed rice goes in. This is a steamed rice for the Hatsuzoe. All the yeast that you need for the whole batch goes in at the Hatsuzoe. We want the yeast to be stronger than anything else so that the yeast population grows, multiplies, and becomes active. Second day, odori, we don't make any addition to the tank. We just give it a stir. Second step, 
which is called nakazoe, and only rice, water, and koji goes in at the second step. And then the last step, tomezoe, is the same thing, and this will fill up the tank to the level that you are aiming for. All the rice, all the koji has been melted down into this mash called moromi. After the moromi is finished fermenting, we pour it into a bag. Well, this method is called shizuku. Shizuku means drip. We're allowing the sake to drip out of these bags. This is a process in Japan usually done by at least two to three people. <laughs> I have went through a lot to figure out how to do it by myself. I fell in love with sake when I had my first premium sake called Jumai Dai Ginjo. I was so surprised by how it tastes. It's nothing like the stuff I've been drinking. I started with homebrewing beer. At that time, I was working as a sake specialist. I studied everything about alcohol industry. I realized at that point that a lot of Americans have a misconception of what sake is. I took on a mission to clarify this misconception that Americans have. This is actually a really traditional way of um, pressing sake. They only use this method for super premium sake in Japan. We only collect the best part of the sake, so it's laborious, time consuming, but it is worth it. We let it hang in the air for one to two days. Any alcohol product, if it touches oxygen, it will start to degrade. What we like to do is push CO2 in this. CO2 gas is heavier than oxygen, so it'll start to purge out that air. So we're trying to rid of any ox oxygen in there to keep it fresh inside. Now we're gonna transfer that, and we're gonna let it clear up again in this tank for about two weeks. When the sake is it's dripped out, it still has what's called ori in the sake. Ori is rice particles, and we let the sake naturally settle using time and gravity. I do like to keg all my sake after the secondary tank onto a bottling to keep it as fresh as possible. And as soon as it's all clarified and matured, we can get it into bottles. Me and my partner, we just always felt something was missing in LA and that's a local sake brewery and tasting room. So I kind of started to think that maybe I can turn this into a profession and actually start the first sake brewery of LA. So this machine does purge the bottle with CO2, so it gets all that oxygen out, keep it fresh. I put a lot of time, a lot of effort to try to make a sake that tastes good. I would often think, what am I doing? Is this gonna actually really work? Our sake is all namazake. Namazake means fresh, unpasteurized sake. I'm brewing almost every single day with no day off. Two years ago, I would have never imagined that I'll be actually making sake. Because it is unpasteurized, it is a live product, it will change over time. Just like an aged wine, it'll just make some changes in the bottle. I would say drink, drink within the first month. So you definitely, first thing you notice is that effervescence. The best indicator of freshest namazake will be the existence of a little effervescence in the sake. Sometimes I would be here until like 1 a.m. You've worked all day, so you feel so tired. But then from the brewery, you start to hear bubbles coming out, and that's a sign that the yeast is doing its job. It's a beautiful sound. Even though my body is tired, it makes me feel good about what I'm doing, and I feel satisfied, you know? I'm still at the point where everything is surreal. I'll never be proud of myself more than this.